Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank you uh, for joining this evening's lecture and conversation with Dr. Ross Carlin. This is the second presentation in the Edgar P. Richardson Lecture Series for 2020. I am Gwendolyn Bois shaw I'm the Senior Historian and the Acting Chief Curator here at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. I'm also the Director of Portal, the National Portrait Gallery Scholarly Center, the organizer of today's event. Because we will be showing images as a part of today's presentation, we recommend that you select the gallery, active speaker, or thumbnail view in the top right corner of your screen in order to better see the panelists and the presentation. This presentation is, of course, best viewed on a computer. However, if you're using your smartphone um, or another mobile device, we recommend that you orient it vertically in order to minimize glitches and to optimize your view. We have live closed captioning available, which can be accessed along the bottom menu, as can the Q&A function, the question and answer function, into which you're welcome to submit questions to be answered during the second half of the event. And you can submit those questions at any time. Despite gathering digitally today, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. In the material world, the National Portrait Gallery is very excited to once again be open to the public. So if you're in the Washington DC area or plan to be in coming weeks, we encourage you to visit our website first and reserve a free timed entry pass. We are open Wednesdays through Sundays from 11.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. At the National Portrait Gallery, we believe that portraiture is powerful, but we also fully acknowledge that not all people have had equal access to dominant modes of portraiture, especially painting and sculpture. Nor did many marginalized peoples always have control over the ways that they were represented by the dominant culture. This was especially the case for some women, many Native and Indigenous people, all enslaved people, and most working class people who could not afford to commemorate their visages. That is why we are firmly committed to diversifying our collections by collecting at least 50% portraits of people of color each year and mounting a diverse exhibition schedule. This is evident in our permanent collection exhibitions, including the recently opened Her Story, A Century of Women Writers, which features portraits of 24 influential authors, such as Margaret Wise Brown, Sandra Cisneros, Lorraine Hansberry, Toni Morrison, Anne Sexton, Susan Sontag, Maxine Hong Kingston, and Alice Walker. We are pleased that Her Story was supported by the Smithsonian's American Women's History Initiative which supports both exhibitions and acquisitions that bring women's lives and accomplishments into sharper focus. The theme, Women, Portraiture, and Power, was chosen in part um, due to our commitment to a diverse and inclusive programming, but also as a complement to our upcoming exhibition, Every Eye is Upon Me, First Ladies of the United States. With the recent nomination of Senator Kamala Harris as the Democratic Party's candidate for the vice presidency, issues of gender, representation, and influence seem to be well worth discussing, not to mention the current Supreme Court um, justice nomination. Um, named in honor of Edgar P. Richardson, this lecture series pays tribute to Mr. Richardson's significant contributions to the field of American art. During his career, he distinguished himself as a scholar, as a director of both the Detroit Institute of Art and the H.F. DuPont Winter Turpin Museum. As a co-founder of the Archives of American Art, as a president and a board member of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and as a commissioner of the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery from 1966, when we were founded, until 1979. Mr. Richardson impacted the study of American art through exhibitions, such as the publication of A Short History of Painting in America, the story of 450 years from 1956, um, and its 1977 revision. They were far more diverse publications than one might have expected. Um, and here's a little quote from Mr. Richardson, the serious critical study of American art is required to enable us to understand ourselves as people something I firmly uh, agree. Um, the Edgar P. Richardson Symposium was established at the National Portrait Gallery with the generous support of Mr. Richardson's longtime friend and fellow former National Portrait Gallery Commissioner, Mr. Robert L. McNeil, Jr. 
And we are grateful to his philanthropic legacy via the Barra Foundation, whose current custodians have allowed us to temporarily convert the symposium into this online lecture series. Over the coming weeks, we have asked our speakers to focus on women as artists and as subjects. The relationships to power that these individuals found themselves in were made for themselves or were communicated through their representations. We have also invited meditations on art and artists from outside of the United States in the belief that the story of American art is formed by more than the temporal border of 1776, nor can its creative journey be amended by current restrictions on travel and immigration. At the end of each slide presentation in the lecture series, we will have a brief conversation between the presenter, myself, and some of our other Richardson lecturers, followed by questions from you, the online audience, which may be submitted through the question answer button at the bottom of your screen. I would like to invite you to join us again on Tuesday, October 13th at 5 p.m. for the third Edgar P. Richardson lecture. Marking the Middle, Lois Melu Jones's Mid-Century Portrait Practice, which will be given by Professor Rebecca Van Diver of Vanderbilt University. Please visit our website, npg.si.edu slash portal for a full list of speakers and topics. And now to introduce today's speaker. Ross Carlin earned his PhD at Georgetown University with a focus on Portugal and Spain in the 15th and 16th centuries. His dissertation examined the cultural history of shame, and his broader work deals with the court culture and material networks at the beginnings of the Iberian empires. And I, I, I hope I have a question about shame for you, Ross, <laughs> as, as we head into um, the Q&A. As a recent fellow at the National Portrait Gallery, Carlin researched portraits of Margaret of Austria, Queen of Spain, uh, and her dates are 1599 to 1611, and representations of her complex role as a powerful woman within the court of her husband, Felipe III. Um, uh, Carlin is currently co-editing a volume entitled Unbound by Their Covers, Late Medieval and Early Modern Iberian Books in Their Global History which takes a novel, again, another pun there, huh? A novel approach to book history in the Spanish and Portuguese world. A recent transplant to Los Angeles, Ross teaches at the Geffen Academy at UCLA. Uh, welcome, Ross. All right, thank you, Gwendolyn, for that very kind introduction. And yes, as you know, over the many years of knowing me that I love a good pun, so, uh, I had to throw something in there. Yeah, um, not I, Armano. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am going to uh, take control of the screen here. Oops. And here we go. So a uh, quick thank you to Gwendolyn very much for that very kind and lovely introduction. Um, and also I do want to express my gratitude both to you, to Jackie Petito, and everyone at the National Portrait Gallery for being uh, so welcoming uh, during my time there, even though it was cut a little bit short by these uh, very unprecedented times in which we find ourselves. Um, so just to begin, as Gwendolyn mentioned, today's presentation is the result of my time as a research fellow at the National Portrait Gallery uh, this past spring. Um, but the project I'm sharing with everyone today, Margaret of Austria, Queen of Spain, Power of Femininity and Portraiture in the Court of Felipe III or Felipe III. Um, this is kind of a, a, a fun thing that started as a small spark uh, during a trip to Chicago in September of 2019. Um, as I roamed the galleries of the Art Institute of Chicago, I was struck by this particular portrait by Andres Lopez Polanco of Queen Margaret of Spain or Margaret of Austria, who reigned from 1598, 1599 until her death in 1611. What had originally caught my eye about this portrait was the book in the queen's hand, uh, resting on the back of the chair while her finger holds her page. While fellow onlookers in the gallery marveled at the intricate details of the dress, of her clothing, of the jewels, um, as was suggested by the wall text uh, to look at the crown jewels uh, adorning her dress, my eye kept returning to the book. Uh, after all, and as Gwendolyn mentioned, what is a book historian to do? 
The image took me back to conversations I had had at the very beginning of my academic career uh, with a colleague, George Greenia, a specialist of the Camino de Santiago and a pilgrim on the Camino himself. We had once discussed at length this portrait of Juan de Flandes. Uh, it was a portrait of the Apostle St. James, a work known as the Santiago Peregrino, or St. James the Pilgrim, from about 1519, today on view at the Museo del Prado. Equipped with a staff and depicted with a scallop shell, an emblem of the famed pilgrimage, the apostle is shown with his finger marking the page of a manuscript codex as his eyes gaze down at the ornate book in front of him. The motif is by no means unique to these two portraits, but this particular painting of Juan de Flandes stuck with me over the years because of these conversations. The motif is known as a demonstration of the ever advancing technology of the book as manuscripts in Cunabula and early print books became flippable, dynamic, and as silent reading took on a more important role in the early modern period. The marking of the page is also recognized as the passing of time, a brief interruption in an action that occurs both before and after the sitter's likeness is brought to the canvas. Reading is a process and a journey, if you will, where interruptions and pauses are part of, pointing, of getting from point A to point B. And like St. James, his pilgrimage is like his very reading action, stopped for a moment in time for this portrait, but it is a journey with a destination. This reading of Juan de Flandes' work crept into, my, into the front of my mind upon viewing the portrait by Polanco. If we were interrupting the queen, what was she reading? What was her journey? And what was her process of reading like in this period? And why would Polanco choose to include a book in the queen's portrait among so many other signs of her wealth and elegance? In answering these questions, I embarked on my own journey into the world of portraiture in the court of Felipe III, or Felipe III, Margaret's husband and second cousin, as was common, uh, the King of Spain from 1598 until his death in 1621. I would come to conclude that the book opens the door to understanding Margaret as a complex, powerful, and dynamic queen, and her portraits offer a new perspective on Margaret's place in the court of her husband and within Spanish royal history as a whole. Little is known about Andres Lopez Polanco beyond the fact that he was a court artist living in Madrid, likely born in Valladolid at the beginning of the 17th century. It was the court painter and his predecessor, Juan Pantoja de la Cruz, who established Margaret's courtly image in her royal portraits. In fact, Polanco's portrait from 1610 is a copy of one of Pantoja's portrait from about 1607, as we see here on these two slides with some obvious differences, uh, but the latter being a, a copy of the former. The portrait from 1607 is one of many that bears similar composition, depicting the queen full length with a large dress or saya and objects in both hands. The two portraits I'm particularly interested in today are these two, uh, and they all look alike, so well, I'll try and keep, uh, keep it clear, right? Um, but the two portraits I'm interested in, in here are from 1605 and 1607. The first on the left, is at Hampton Court and part of the British Royal Collection and was a gift to the English crown after the 1604 Treaty of London. The second on the right, today at the Museo del Prado, was part of the Spanish Royal Collection. While these portraits are similar in many ways, I wanna dive into their subtle differences that we'll look at today in order to better understand Margaret as a complex woman of power, both as a devout queen, but also a cunning ruler. These two sides of Margaret's identity and queenship that I allude to were not always so apparent, however. Scholarly attention to the court of Felipe III and to the portraits of Margaret herself often rely on a historically static reading of the queen and, and really only point to her position of wealth and as a descendant of the Austrian side of the Habsburg dynasty that dominated Europe at the time. The court of Felipe III was known to be one that was deeply religious and the queen was no exception. Often noted for her religious piety and devotion, Margaret was not always considered an important political figure until more recently. Magdalena Sanchez, for example, notes that in most biographies and eulogies written shortly after her death, Margaret was presented as a, quote, example of feminine virtue and proper behavior for aristocratic women, end quote. Though this is not necessarily uh, in, in relation to her true life, or it does not necessarily correspond to her real identity. 
Sanchez's work is an incredibly important contribution to early modern Spanish historiography recently, in that it pushes back against this long-standing narrative of a sort of static reading of the queen. A similar phenomenon happens in an initial analysis of her portraits by Pantoja de la Cruz. The queen is depicted as, of, or is often considered to be depicted as stiff and rigid, her bulky and almost angular dresses uh, almost constraining her movement. In both of these portraits by Pantoja, uh, both of the king and of the queen, uh, we see that their face have an almost mask-like quality to them, flat, static, and, de and depicting in the words of Sarah Schroff, uh, what she calls an ideal image of monarchs or an image of ideal monarchs where their true identity is hidden and inaccessible behind this masked facade. This aspect of Pantoja's work is incredibly important within the context of his artistic creation. And from an art historical perspective, this is wildly important, right? The mass quality of the queen's face and stiffness recalls a style of portraiture often associated with the Low Countries and many of the Flemish and Netherlandish artists that made their way to Spain in the 16th century. These artists, including the great portraitist Antonis Moore or Antonio Moro, as he was known on the peninsula, traveled and worked in, in Lisbon, Madrid, and other cities throughout the Iberian Peninsula. And Pantoja and, other, and others had the opportunity to work with them, see their work, and study their works. Pantoja was well-trained in, uh, in these northern traditions. Um, as well as the Italian traditions brought to Spain through Titian, who served as court painter under Felipe II. Uh, however, as Schroff points out, Pantoja does reject the Venetian style in, and use uh, more of a, in use of natural light rather, he uses more of an artificial light, especially in these examples that we'll look at today, uh, really pulling from that northern tradition. I also turn to Javier Portus's observation that in the case of the portraits of the queens, it is really the queen's relationship to the, to the king that is generally highlighted. Uh, displaying the papel pasivo or passive role that was reserved for these women. This, however, was not always the case, especially in Pantoja's portrayal of Queen Margaret. As we will see throughout this talk today, uh, many of the elements of his work show that he understood the queen's role within the court. Uh, he understood the nuances of her position as anything but passive. In order to understand this true political role and power, I thus wish to look across Pantoja's works as opposed to one portrait individually. So let us begin with the Hampton Court portrait from 1605. Given to England as a gift after the signing of the Treaty of London in 1604, as I mentioned, the portrait bears some striking elements in its likeness of the Queen. The Treaty of London itself ended a nearly 20 year conflict between Spain and England. And the treaty was one of peace but did not really offer any victory to one crown over the other. A number of elements in the portrait uh, by Pantoja, however, offer a rather fun and playful reading, in my opinion, one where the Spanish crown is actually poking fun or at least engaging in political competition with their English enemy in the wake of this treaty. The first and most, most straightforward element here is the dress itself. The queen's sigh is embroidered with the images of a castle and a lion together to Castilla y Leon, as well as the double-headed eagle of the House of Austria. These symbols are a nod to the queen's lineage as a Habsburg and Spanish monarch. And to double down on the opulence, the seals are surrounded by images of flowers, pearls, golden threads, uh, and other fine details. Her dress exudes Spanishness and Habsburgness in an assertion of power to the work's foreign audience. The book on the table, however, holds another key to the portrait's deeply political nature. Margaret holds open an ornate book of hours on the table beside her, opening the page to an illumination of the Virgin identified as the woman of the apocalypse from the book of Revelation. The image illustrates the queen's allegiance to the Virgin Mary and through this Marian imagery to the Catholic church more broadly. In 1605, England had already established itself as a Protestant realm and rejected the cult of the Virgin. The book's placement on the table is thus curious because it's an explicit display of this particular image. The queen is not in the process of reading this book, but props it up in such a way that the image of the version is facing the viewer directly. She's showing it off to her English uh, recipient of this gift. As a portraitist, Pantoja likely used this image for its multi-layered meaning. On one hand, it's an assertion of the queen's faith, 
which was one of vital importance uh, to the representation of the Spanish crown through portraiture. As Javier Portus notes, the connection between portraiture and faith illustrated the responsibility associated with the monarchy as a defender of the faith and Catholic orthodoxy. And as a gift to Protestant England, this religious overtone is yet another example of this sort of us versus them, as we can call it, a display within the work. It illustrates the political tensions that were not quite resolved by the treaty in the previous year. It's in the following portrait from 1607 where the book itself takes on a bit more complex significance within the context of the work. This portrait uses almost exactly the same composition as the Hampton Court portrait, uh, the queen shown in full length, similar clothing, uh, though here without the political embroidery. Um, she wears the same crown jewels, the diamond known as el estanque or the pond, and the pearl known as la peregrina or the pilgrim. But the difference in composition in this work rests in quite literally the chair uh, where we see the queen's hand holding the book. Pantoja's details in the work are exquisite here, uh, even showing how the fabric of the back of the chair folds with the weight of the queen's hand. Uh, and every detail of the dress is is unbelievably precise. The beauty of the portrait though comes with a troubling history. The portrait came in the wake of tragedy, the 1600 fire at the Palacio Real de El Pardo. The royal palace at El Pardo was a countryside estate in the outskirts of Madrid that housed the royal portrait collection. It was destroyed in this fire, though from the rubble emerged a new wave of art commissioned by King Felipe that would serve to rebuild the gallery. And here we have an image of uh, what the Palacio Real del Pardo looks like today uh, after its rebuilding in the 16th century with later 18th century additions and renovations. <clears throat> um, Juan Pantoja de la Cruz was one of the artists with the most vital and important roles in this new process of commission uh, work. Um, he would fill in the gaps of, dip, of different Habsburg family members, bringing new images to the Royal Gallery. Um, according to Hernando de Espejo's 1614 inventory of the Palacio, over 35 commissioned portraits were painted by Pantoja alone. And with this new investment in the art that had been destroyed also came a new shift in the gallery's representation. As alluded to, there was a new emphasis in the House of Austria. Um, and actually an elimination of many Spanish nobles uh, whose portraits were destroyed. Uh, the court of Felipe III decided to put more emphasis on the family as opposed to the Spanish nobility and court culture. Works like the portrait of Margaret are therefore deliberately opulent and grand as a part of the king's initiative to portray the court as a strong, powerful, and rich court. Uh, the Austrias made sure that their works were often pop propagandistic and powerful, and it was common not only in El Pardo, but throughout Habsburg Europe, uh, to decorate palaces with extravagant portraits as a sign of their dominance on the world stage. Margaret's 1607 portrait is no exception. And it is no surprise that this new mission of the gallery's reconstruction um, would leave Pantoja to turn to the young queen as a frequent subject of his work. Yet the outwardly propagandistic elements of the work um, are perhaps its false facade, uh, the jewels, the dress, the riches. As a whole, this portrait stands in contrast to the 1605 Hampton Court portrait because it is one that is deeply domestic, meant for a domestic audience in the royal palace, and one that emerges out of the ashes of the royal palace itself. It's an inward look at the queen's identity and her role in the court. As previously mentioned, history has often written Margaret to be a passive, uh, a passive queen. Though recent work has shown that she did have a great, a great amount of political weight in the court of Felipe III. While the court's image was from the outside one of wealth and opulence, it was not immune to internal political struggles and strife, mainly surrounding conflicting relationships with the king's favorite, the Duque de Lerma or Duke of Lerma, here painted in his equestrian portrait by Peter Paul Rubens. 
the bright, whimsical colors of this portrait and his appearance on horseback reinforce this opulence and the court, uh, in the court rather, and illustrate his power within F uh, Felipe's political system. He was a nobleman, knight, strong, powerful, uh, and viewed with a lot of respect by the king. He and the king had an incredibly close relationship, and it was the duke who often organized the moving parts of Felipe's reign. Royal chronicler of the time, Gonzalez Davila, is often credited with saying that the Duke, along with the King, inaugurated a new style of grandeur to oppose the austerity of the court of Felipe II, Felipe III's father. However, the Duke, most importantly, had a contentious relationship with Margaret, uh, as well as two other women of the Habsburg family, Felipe's grandmother, the Empress Maria of Austria, and Margaret of the Cross, Felipe's aunt, who had joined the church. Magdalena Sanchez outlines how these three women influenced and shaped the, fort, the court of Felipe III. These women and Margaret, uh, Queen Margaret especially, held so much power and represented this Eastern side of the family, of the Habsburg family, as opposed to the Spanish side, uh, that the Duque de Lerma felt threatened by them and saw that uh, all of their power as a danger to the Spanish side represented by Felipe III and his father and his lineage. At points, the tensions within the court were so strong that the Duke insisted that Felipe move the capital to Valladolid from Madrid to separate Margaret from her influence over him. Margaret was keenly aware of the power that she had. Um, it is Sanchez uh, who says that she could use her, quote, affectionate relationship with the king and her private access to him and their blood ties to sway his opinion on given matters, end quote. Uh, her power was rooted in, her, in the king's trust in her, and he always listened to her advice. As a member of the court, Pantoja would have likely seen this side of the queen's relationship with the king. After all, in addition to his royal patronage from the king, the queen herself sat for Pantoja and commissioned multiple works by herself of her children uh, by the portraitist. They likely had a working relationship of their own, and Pantoja was not blind to her cunning ways. On the canvas, this appears in two iconographic elements that I wish to point out, the handkerchief and the closed book, which of course, as I mentioned, is the impetus of today's talk. The handkerchief is an almost ubiquitous icon of early modern portraits of women, but held contradictory interpretations. On one hand, it was a symbol of cleanliness, while at the same time, the receptacle for bodily fluids. The handkerchief is a social object used by prostitutes and nobles alike, meaning context is crucial to its interpretation and its relationship to class, status, identity, and gender. Here in this portrait, all these ambiguities come into play. The queen's handkerchief could be viewed as an element to represent her piety and faith as a symbol of cleanliness, but the ambiguities of the symbol can also be read in conversation with a more secular aspect of the work. The handkerchief is found in the queen's left hand and not her right. And it's worth noting that scholars point to this as a potentially sinister suggestion of deception. It's thus possible that Pantoja places the handkerchief purposely in her left hand to obscure and blur the queen's alleged clean identity in favor of her knack for deception and manipulation in her position of power. In returning to the overarching theme of today's talk, however, I want to turn to the second iconographic element here, which is the book. Here, uh, examined both in terms of its visual value, but also through the lens of bibliography. As discussed previously, the finger marking the page is often considered an interruption of the reading process. It is a marker of time during the sitter's silent reading. On the Iberian Peninsula, this trope was often used to depict moments of religious devotion specifically. Juan de Flandes' uh, portrait of Isabel the Catholic, uh, returning to Juan de Flandes, who I love, uh, his portrait here of Isabel the Catholic, Isabel la Catolica, for example, shows the famed queen in a solemn state of prayer, momentarily glancing up from what is likely a book of hours, some sort of other devotional text, and marking her place with her thumb. Compared to the austerity of the Catholic queen here, Margaret's religious moment is contrasted with her elegance and her elaborate costuming. The penetrative finger, as I will call it, does nod to other deeply religious connotations, evident in Michel Sitov's painting of Catherine of Aragon as, the, as Mary Magdalene, a portrait a lo divino from the 16th, uh, 16th century, uh, which is actually 
uh, from the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, relevant for today's talk. Um, as well as, and we're gonna move on to the next slide quickly, as well as Caravaggio's uh, Incredulity of St. Thomas. In both of these works, the penetrative finger plays a central role in the religious context of the painting. For Mary Magdalene, the finger holds open the chalice, while for Thomas, it is a penetration of Jesus's wounds that serve as proof of his resurrection uh, in the story. These examples have an, have an explicitly religious significance. Um, and Margaret's portrait very well could be uh, one of religious devotion as well. Through bibliographic research, it is known that Margaret's personal library was full of devotional texts. Fernando Bausa points to the Queen's personal library uh, as having over 10 volumes of the Flo Sanctorum and related texts about saints alone, as well as 12 other independent hagiographic works. The library also had two volumes of the Vita Christi or the Life of Christ, seven texts considered to be books of hours, confessionaries or breviaries and other devotional works. These plus over seven volumes of the complete works of Luis de Granada's writing, works about the Dominican order, counter-reformation philosophy texts, all add up to a library that certainly attested to the queen's devotional practices and Catholic faith. But at the same time, Bausa's work on the queen's library points to her political identity. In fact, Bausa argues that books were the vehicle through which works on politics and governance entered the queen's life. Her library included books on Spanish history, chronicles of the Spanish monarchy, and works of political philosophy. Of 358 volumes uh, that are recorded in Hernando de Espejo's uh, bibliographic uh, inventory, um, at least 100, and I threw out the term, uh, the number rather, uh, 100 as a very loose definition of what I would call textos profanos, right? Or, or profane or uh, text with very relig little religious content. Um, that said, of course, uh, even texts that were not explicitly religious probably had some sort of religious component. But here, uh, just as a ballpark figure, uh, over 100 texts were considered textos profanos. Um, this was anything dealing with history, philosophy, literature, and other matters. Let's take, for example, Juan de Torres' uh, Primera y Segunda Parte de la Filosofía Moral de Príncipes, or the first and second parts of the moral philosophy of princes. These are two volumes among dozens that focus on po politics and government. Not to mention, the queen was intimately aware of Spain's goings-on overseas and imperial goals, as well as the, the monarchy itself, a history of the monarchy itself. Uh, texts such as the Descripción General de África, or the General Description of Africa, or the Conquista de las Islas Malucas, um, or uh, the Conquest of the Malucas uh, in, the, in the East, are two such examples that the Queen was well-versed not only in domestic affairs in theory, but in the history of the Crown's interest abroad. Um, and I point to the Descripción General de África and the Conquista de las Malucas as two very interesting examples uh, because these are two territories where Spain had attempted, right, to, to have an imperial presence, uh, but did not succeed as well. Uh, um, you know, Spain did have some uh, imperial presence in West Africa, but really that was up to Portugal. And the Malucas ended up uh, uh, in southern India, Goa, that really ended up in Portuguese hands, while Spain still uh, had their imperial presence in the Philippines. Okay, so what does this mean for Pantoja's portrait? Uh, if Margaret is not reading a devotional text, it is entirely possible, given the context of her library, that the work would be some sort of political or historical work. A text that would imply that the queen knew how to play politics within her husband's court and or was well versed in the works that would have guided the king and his political allies like the Duque de Lerma. The context and content of the Queen's Library nicely complements the closed state of the book here in the portrait. If we accept Jeffrey Hamburger's reading that the tension between concealment and revelation is, quote, embodied by the closed and open book, end quote, then we can begin to understand what the Queen might be hiding or what Pantoja might be hiding behind the Queen's pious facade. In the closed book, unlike the open book in the Hampton Court portrait, the contents are a mystery. Its truths are concealed. And the moment of interruption by the viewer and by the portraitist might very well be a moment of political power, cunning, 
and feminine power within a male-dominated court space. The book is a sort of metonym of the queen, I would argue, negotiating between open and closed states from portrait to portrait, but also representative of her concealment of her own power, depending on the context. It's important to emphasize this idea of feminine power here. As Hamburger would note, the act of reading would often be gendered as female. And the queen's positioning of her hand with the penetrative finger marking her page evokes a deeply feminine image of the book itself, and perhaps even a sexual subtext. This choice by Pandocha adds another layer of depth to the image of the book, drawing a closer relationship between her femininity and her concealed power. Given the theme of this year's symposium, um, and speaker series rather, of women, power, and portraiture, I wish to conclude with that very idea. The court space of the Spanish Habsburgs was a complex web of family bloodlines, political rivals, and a commitment to Catholic doctrine at almost every level. The court of Felipe III was no exception, but unfortunately history had already established its model of what that court looked like. Today, I hope to have shown that through Pantoja's portraiture and through a more nuanced reading of the history of the time and the material culture of that court, we can arrive at a more dynamic understanding of Queen Margaret, as Austri uh, Queen Margaret of Austria's role, excuse me, as a woman of power in the 17th century. The queen died young in childbirth in 1611, but her effigy in portraiture serves as a testament to both her femininity and her political prowess, both at home in Iberia and abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. That was fantastic. Oh. I was like totally enraptured and I didn't want you to wrap up so soon. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, this is really great. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad you've given me a, a little way to, to, ask, to ask about shame because one of the first questions that came through um, uh, was about, um, uh, the queen's dates and mm -hmm. um, and and that she ascended to the throne in um, in 1585. Let me see where did the question go? Right. So, oh, wait a second. So she reigned from 1599 to 1611, but she was born in 1584. Is that correct? Yeah. She was so not young. only so not only was she married to her second cousin, <laughs> but she was a child bride. Yes, a child bride. And, and um, no shame in that royal gang, huh? No shame in that royal gang. Um, so, yeah, so at this point, uh, Margaret was one of the youngest queens, uh, like, in her period, right? She died super young in 1611. She was in her 20, 20s, 30s, right? Mm -hmm. I'm terrible at math. That's why I studied art and literature. Um, right, so she died in childbirth. Um, but really the point of her of her marriage was, was a political one. Um, the Habsburgs at this time were starting to begin to feel the pressure of the colonies of their, of their presence abroad. Um, they wanted to still exude this sort of opulent identity. Um, but, and in order to maintain that power rather, uh, marrying between both the Eastern and Western sides of the Habsburg family uh, was part of their uh, shtick, to use it very <laughs> informal. It was their MO, right? In order to maintain uh, their power. Um, uh, a little anecdote in terms of my time actually at the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, I remember in my cubicle setting up the family tree and getting a lot of stares right in the, in the cubicle of, of every, all the cousins intermarrying with each other um, <laughs> in order to keep track for myself as I sat at my desk, uh, sort of what uh -huh. the relationships were. But uh -huh. yes, uh, she was very young, child bride, um, and the, the Habsburgs, of course, had no shame in that, but uh, yeah. open the yeah. shame conversation. Really. So how many, um, how many portraits of her like this are there? Because it, it seems like you really, you know, you had to start looking at these and looking at what all of the differences and the details mm -hmm. and the kind of progression um, was. So how many did you examine? So over the course of my research, I examined about uh, five or six. Um, mm -hmm. So it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it started with the Polanco portrait at the Art Institute of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I then went back realizing that we had to start with Pantoja um, mm -hmm. because he was the one that was in the court dealing with her. They had the relationship. Mm -hmm. He paints um, four portraits with a similar composition to this one here. 
Um, one is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, it has her hand resting on a table. Uh, the other one is a, at a collection in Madrid that has her hand, instead of a book, it has a fan or an abanico. Mm -hmm. uh, she then also has some half-length portraits, um, multiples of those. And then after Pantoja, uh, after his career, we have Polanco's, we have Bartolome Gonzalez and other portraitists that uh, continue the tradition of painting her even after her death. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, a, there's an incredible number. Uh, for today's talk, of course, uh, there's only yeah. so much you can say, but well, and there's so much there's so much detail in them. One of our one of our right. participants, um, George, George Grinia, um, asks about the 1605 portrait that there's a paper that's fallen to the floor. Yes, I was. What about that paper? Yes, I was hoping to get a question about that. So um, okay. let's see here. Um, I'm not sure if I can go back in my slides. Let's see if we can do this. Um, here we go. You could yeah, if you want to jump out to the. I think we. Got it here. There we go. So yes. So we have this lovely little detail of the paper on the bottom left hand corner, um, which uh, we don't necessarily know. So I, the reading that I have, and this is in, in consultation with uh, some of my colleagues who I was like, what do we think this is? Um, it's almost as if this is part of Pandoja's uh, peacocking, right, in this portrait, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he puts the Spanish seal, he puts the Habsburg seal, he's using this Catholic imagery, and then there's almost this artistic element of him to put this little detail um, as like this, this trick of the eye at the bottom of the paper, uh, the bottom of the canvas rather, uh, where you can see his skill, right, in depicting this sort of free flowing paper on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost kind of coming into our space. It's exactly. Like close right? enough. Yeah. It has this like very sort of like trompa del ojo effect, right? That um, that's that's beautiful. So um, in my interpretation of that little paper, um, it really is more of of this sort of artistic peacocking by by mm -hmm. Pantoja for mm -hmm. this foreign audience. So it's not legible then. It's not from what I. Um, you know, if I if I if. The world was a little different and I was able to fly <laughs> to London and, and take a look at it up close. Like we don't know what we'd be able to see, but um, yeah. in, my, in the research that I was able to do uh, in the circumstances we are currently in, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I do not know if it is legible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that's, so, so that's a post-pandemic footnote yeah, that to, is a, to follow up on. A, a post-pandemic. Yeah, yeah. uh, can, can you also say a little bit more, um, uh, Stephen Roberts asks about the handkerchief in the left hand yeah. um, and whether that might be an Islamic influence, a Muslim that's a great, influence. That's a great question. Um, thank you for that. Um, that is not an interpretation I've come across. Um, it's entirely possible. I will be absolutely honest and just say I, I don't know too much about mm -hmm. um, the, the Muslim or Islamic uh, influence there. Uh, in that interpretation. From what I've been able to find in my research, uh, the, the subtleties of the left versus right is really based on Catholic doctrine. Um, sort of how the left, the, your left side, right, is always associated yeah. with the devil, uh, negative energy, right, that negative space versus the right. Um, in the 1605 one here in the Hampton Court portrait, um, you know, it almost makes sense, right? You only have two hands and we're gonna stick the virgin in, in your right hand as opposed, <laughs> to, as opposed to the left. Yeah, um, yeah, good. But, Even right, so, the, the messaging there. Uh -huh. Exactly, right? Um, but that's a great question. I will, I will definitely have to look more into that because it's, uh, just being totally honest, it's not something I know a ton about. Yeah. Um, uh, it reminded me a little bit of like the, the language of the fan, you know, and, and mm -hmm. how complex, um, you know, that yes, is. Yes, of course. Um, Marianne Goley asks about the size of the book, you know, whether yes. the, the small scale points more towards devotional um, mm -hmm. or, you know, as, as you're arguing a little bit towards um, uh, history. Yeah, so um, the size of the book, and let's, uh, here's a good place to, to stay. Um, so the size of the book is absolutely indicative of, of a lot of the uh, sort of practical genres that we might associate with, with this print history. Um, books of this size, absolutely, absolutely, um, you know, would have been devotional, or rather, we can almost think of it like rectangle square scenario, right? Devotional works uh, would be of this size. Um, this is, you know, a relatively small book, um, 
if it's print, right, and not manuscript, its size would absolutely be indicative of some sort of probably book of hours, some mm -hmm. sort of prayer book. Um, but that said, there were also a lot of uh, secular works that would have been printed uh, in all sorts of different sizes. Um, part of that would have just been based on money. If you had uh, books that were printed, uh, you know, in much larger quantities, uh, to print them, you know, smaller would have been a different price than printing them in large folios or, you know, or, or um, you know, quartos. Um, so, yeah, so I think that there's a lot to be said there. Um, again, in a post-COVID world, uh, to actually be able to, you know, dig through the archives of her personal library and see what would have been what size. In Hernando de Espejo's inventory, he mentions uh, the price. Um, so that's one direction you could go. There's also then uh, a lot of cross-referencing that can be done based on what editions would have been available at the time. Um, so that would be another way to check which size. Um, but, but yes. When, uh, when was that inventory done? I mean, 358 is, books, that's, that's a lot of books. Yes, so she was quite library. an avid reader. Uh, that inventory was done in the 1630s. Um, uh -huh. I have the exact date actually, 1634. Five, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was done after her death. And uh, yeah, 358 books is a wild amount of books. I mean, and uh, part of Fernando Bausa's work that's really interesting is the fact that he does say, um, you know, this was important. The fact that she was such an avid reader and that her library was so huge. Uh, you know, she wasn't just sitting there reading prayers all day long. It wasn't just a religious experience all the time. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I hope that answered yeah. the question. I don't know that kind of went in seven different directions, but oh, yes. Well, 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 I'm sure we'll hear if, if there's a, a follow-up <laughs> requested. Um, you know, you know I, I was really interested in the discussion of the penetrative mm -hmm. Um, and also in thinking about this book, it, you know, with its V shape as a kind of, you know, vaginative image yes. Yes. Um, and the way that it rhymes um, with different elements of her costume. Right? Absolutely. Yes. And, and that there's a choice between the different portraits, um, you know, whether the book is open on the table in a way that does not, you know, communicate that kind of, you know, um, the uh, you know the allusion to uh, a bodily form exactly yeah um, and as we see here in the 1607 the the sleeve and I, I was just scrolling through the comments and I saw someone mm -hmm. say it looks like this the sleeve is folded too yeah um, so that sort of uh, you know vaginal quality of the sleeve is mm -hmm. absolutely echoed in the book here um, and I I'm, I'm if, if you will allow me, Gwendolyn, I'm also looking at Jill Rothschild's uh, uh, comment here, right? Just uh, to, to talking about the raciness of it, of the book, right? If it was not a devotional book. So in one, in, in my meditation on this portrait, uh, the sleeve and the penetrative finger of the book almost compound on each other in a way that might say that this is not a devotional text, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's just doubling down on this sort of vaginal imagery um, mm -hmm. in a way that pushes back against what the book would be. But that said, I mean, that's like a very subjective reading on my part. And like I said, mm -hmm. part of my meditations on it. Um, uh, I don't know if there is enough, <laughs> I, I, would not, I would not say that there is enough scholarly evidence to, to say yeah. one way or another, uh, which yeah. is why I phrase it that way. But, so, but so, I think so, it's combining those questions, yeah. Since, since we've been speaking about vaginal images, there's, there's a question about dissemination, which I think kind of balances things out. In a way, yeah, yes. In a way, it does. Um, uh, from Sarah McGavern. So Sarah, uh -huh. and, and Sarah, Sarah's uh, uh, pointing to a question that, that, that I have also about this, um, uh, the, the destruction of the portrait collection, you know, enabling mm -hmm. this repositioning um, yes. of the, you know, of the, of the court's power, kind of a concentration of it into the royal family, which can, you know, then be reproduced, you know, multiple times and the nobles, you know, have all gone up in smoke. <laughs> Right. You know, and so they're kind of out of the way. So Sarah asks, um, were these portraits displayed during Queen Margaret's lifetime? Were they given as gifts to other courts? Mm -hmm. um, and did the ways that they were disseminated help assert her power? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the 1605 portrait 
um, to Hampton Court was a gift. So that would have been sent uh, as a gift to the English courts. Um, this 1607 portrait was commissioned by the, by the Spanish court for the Spanish court as part of building back that royal portrait collection. Um, so this one, uh, yes, would have been exhibited uh, as part of the royal collection. Um, it, like I mentioned uh, at one point in, in the talk, it would have been really common for the Habsburgs, especially at this moment, to exhibit their own family portraits constantly. Um, it was their way of, of almost like looking at themselves as powerful monarchs in every palace and in every room they went into. Um, and that's why, of course, I mean, uh, anyone that, that has been to the Prado or uh, you know, any museum in Spain or Portugal or France, right, has seen, like, there's so much Habsburg portraiture all over the place. And it's the, these artists were so prolific in that they were constantly being commissioned to paint the family. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, this portrait would have absolutely been exhibited uh, at least in one palace uh, for the royal family. Whether or not Margaret saw it before her death, um, you know, on a daily basis, uh, we don't know, right? Like it could have gone to their Valladolid Palace as opposed to Madrid. Uh, that just depends. But um, but yes, it was it, this this portrait especially was meant for the royal collection, as opposed mm -hmm. to the 1605, which was meant for a foreign collection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were there ever um, instances instances later on of iconoclasm against these Habsburg images, or have they pretty much kind of come down intact? I mean, they're, I mean, they're all, I mean, like, they're all still part of, like, this royal collection, right? Um, you know, the Habsburg, the Habsburg rule in Spain, and I can speak more to Spain than the eastern side, um, yeah. you know. I mean, I wonder here, you know, like, thinking about Franco, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, did, like, Franco, I mean, this would not be a counterclassum, but maybe, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, he, he changed the, the, how time Mm -hmm. worked right, right. by right, right, aligning right. the Spanish time zone with that of Berlin right of Germany right. Um, and would those kind of you know Habsburg relationships I mean this is kind of a modern discussion we're having about yeah yeah, yeah no, no, piece, no. but you know would 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 these works have you know been useful do you think later on in that way as well yeah I mean so one of the things that I so it's interesting because from my perspective right I come from the earlier side, and this is sort of the later point of, of my uh, scholarly, you know, area, right? Um, but, you know, just as an Iberianist, as you push forward, you know, the Habsburg rule was sort of this, this echo of grandeur, um, especially, you know, this is where we have that, you know, the phrase, right, of the, the empire of the, where the sun never sets, uh, which obviously has been taken, you know, into a million different contexts. It was this moment of riches. So it, it, I think for a lot of time after some of these portraits were, were a memory of that golden age, right? We are in Spain's golden age. Um, so I think that if, yeah, I, I would say that it, it wouldn't be very common to reject this moment in the way I'm trying to phrase this in like, in like a politically correct way. <laughs> Let's leave it there, right? I think that when it comes to actually the, the post Habsburg period, right, there was still sort of always this, this usefulness, mm -hmm. as you said, to, to use your word, right, in that echo of the golden age. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, Goya- Yeah, at that moment. Like, so Goya, you know, when he was doing his royal portraits, you know, still- Yeah, not turned, so flattering, those ones. Though, well, right? not so flattering. But, but, but he also, did tons of them. Tons, but still turned right to this golden age. He still turned uh -huh. to the Velasquez's, right? The, that yeah. circle from 20 years later. Um, so there was still kind of this almost idealism that was associated with this moment of rich and, and you know, opulence, even when Spain hit its, hit its fall, right? When, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden everyone's declaring independence, they're broke uh, and they're kind of falling behind. Yeah. Yeah. Would, yeah. You, you know, um, building on that, Jenna Wendler asks about um, uh, other portraits of Spanish queens. Mm -hmm. Are you know, is this an unusual amount that that Margaret has? Um, were there others who had more or less? Um, you know, following her reign, is this a moment when queen? You know, when when a queen actually does have, um, 
you know, a, a dominant visual presence compared to her um, antecedents and um, her successors? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of yes and no, I would say. Um, for me, what's what really strikes me about Queen Margaret of Austria is that there's so much for her short life. Uh, so it's almost not necessarily a number, but a percentage. Um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of factors there. Part of it is the fact that she was uh, married to the child of Felipe II. Um, and, you know, we are coming out of this super, super rich moment. Uh, we have the fire. So there is a need and urgency to paint royal portraits. Um, so those are two factors that I think really increase the percentage of her portraiture um, and the portraits of this particular queen. That's it. You know, we're going to see tons of really, really high profile portraits of people like, you know, Isabel of Portugal. We're going to see uh, high profile portraits of the Catholic monarchs, uh, especially in the manuscript tradition. Uh, you know, not necessarily these big canvases, but if we're talking about likenesses as transferred to a visual medium, um, you know, she, she has a very high percentage for her lifespan, but, uh, you know, Spain was constantly painting queens. Uh, the whole Iberian Peninsula was really constantly painting queens. Mm -hmm. And I hope that answers that question. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Laia Garcia Sanchez asks, yes. as a costume history student. I just saw that question. That's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm fascinated by the detail on the paintings from this period. They help us see something we would not be able to see otherwise. Could you possibly share more details about the dresses and accessories? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Laia, that's a great question, and I'm sure it's something that you know a lot more than I do about the, the terminology of costumes and everything. Um, but yeah, so even just here, like the, in this particular portrait from 1607, um, the details are absolutely unbelievable. Uh, the two uh, crown jewels as I, that I pointed out in the beginning um, and in the middle at two different points, uh, we have the diamond, this big dark diamond and the big pearl. They're called El Estanque and La Peregrina. These were the, uh, the crown jewels that are seen throughout Margaret's portraiture, but also many of the portraits of other Habsburg queens. Um, the saya itself, this would have been just a very long, elegant dress. Um, here, you know, the details are absolutely unbelievable. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the clasps and how you close it, I think the, the, you know, we see the folds in the dress as we, in the, rather the sleeve as we pointed out before. Um, the details of this type of clothing and these costumes um, he would have definitely got from his experience working with, with uh, or studying the works of portrait, portraitists like Antonis Moore. Um, this was a very, very, very uh, sort of, uh, it was a ubiquitous uh, sort of style of Northern Netherlandish Flemish portraiture uh, to include every single detail of the dress here. Um, and because Spain had so many relationships politically, uh, back and forth uh, and economically uh, with Flanders, uh, you know, he really studied this style. Um, so I don't know much uh, in terms of, you know, what different things are called uh, on the costumes, but uh, feel free to get in touch with me because I'd love to learn. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, just every detail of the dress and yeah. even in the Hampton Court uh, portrait here, like, mm -hmm. you know, all of every single element here has some sort of iconographic significance. Uh, mm -hmm. even to the flower, right? Like, this is a gift to the English court. Like, is it a Tudor rose? I think probably not, but I've seen mm -hmm. the reading out there that some of the mm -hmm. flowers here are nods to a Tudor rose. Mm -hmm. um, that's up to you if you want to uh, believe mm -hmm. in that, right? But you just have so many different elements here, including the yeah. words and everything. So, so there are two questions that kind of that relate to this um, mm -hmm. with the Hampton yeah. Court painting. Um, First, do you have any sense with it? Um, and go back to that detail. I love that. Detail. Oh, the detail, yes. <laughs> um, whether uh, the portrait was um, was displayed there, you know, if it was so much, you know, like a, a literally a penetrative finger in the face. But yeah, right. <laughs> we're actually not with that one because of the, the open image. But, yeah. Um, do you think they would have had it up? Do you have any sense of that? Is there any record that it was displayed, or or was it just like a gift that? maybe that got shifted back into 
So, um, storage. <laughs> so there is documentary evidence of of the gift itself. Um, you know, there is record of the actual of the of the provenance, right, and the gift uh, to uh, to the English court. Whether or not it was displayed immediately, I I don't know. I'm sure there could be some sort of evidence out there. Um, it has been displayed by the British Royal Collection over the years. I mean, especially mm -hmm. recently, it's been a part of uh, different exhibitions yeah. and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah. you know, well, been, you know, I mean, sorry, there's, there's yeah, something yeah. to be said for displaying the portraits of those you have conquered, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know, having vested, like, look, look at all the people that, you know, we got the better of and whose, whose lands we took. And, right. You know. Um, absolutely. And, and I think it's funny that you bring that up too, because, uh, if this was painted in, let's, you know, <clears throat> like the 1590s, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when the tensions were even higher and England was really, really, really strong, um, I would say yes, like 100%, like let's put up the portrait of the enemy. Um, mm -hmm. The Treaty of London in 1604, right, was just kind of there. They kind of were just like, all right, we're, we're cool for a little bit and, uh, and here's your portrait. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there was that same, I, I would say that there is not that same tension that there would have been in like that, ah, we bested you, let's put you up here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's fun to think about though. It is fun to think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've come to six o'clock and we still have 26 unanswered questions, Ross. I know, there's so many. So, <laughs> so that, that's how generative your, <laughs> your talk has been. Um, so I really wanna thank you. And for those of you whose questions were not answered, we have them captured and everything. And um, if they're, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if Ross is able to give answers to them, um, can email them out to you um, uh, later. So I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I hope to see you again in just a couple of weeks um, when we welcome uh, Rebecca Van Diver. Have a good evening. <laughs>